If you would turn in your Bibles to Haggai, the second chapter, Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, and we are in, I think, verse 8 or 9. Haggai chapter 2, verse, um, we'll start back in verse 9. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 9, and just quickly to, uh, to summarize what we have, have learned thus far, uh, in, in Haggai, we've seen, of course, this is one of those uh, post-exilic books we've talked about, uh, one of uh, three prophets. And he is encouraging the people to go back and to build the temple and to restore it again. And they, they stopped. They stopped their work. And we found out that the reason why they stopped their work was there was opposition by the, the Samaritans uh, to, to, uh, to stop them from working. They were very effective in being able to ultimately overcome them. They had said, look, you know what type of people these are. They are rebellious. If you let them go back and you give them an inch, these folks will take a mile. If you let them go in to set up walls, before you know it, they'll stop paying tribute. They will be in rebellion against you. And so after their repeated remarks, uh, it ultimately led the king to stop the work that was there. And again, when we, we learned that the people also, they stopped, uh, not only did they stop doing the work, but they also then abandoned it. And they looked and said, well, the time has not come. And we uh, learned that that was, again, sort of twofold. One, that they looked at the opposition and more or less said that, because we're being oppressed and or we, because we don't have a green light, then that means this is not the right season to do it. Then the other aspect of it was as well, as they were looking at the 70 years and they said, well, you know, there's still some more time. And so when that time, in essence, is checked off, then that will be the time to go into build. And so we learn that that was not how God would have them to view the matter. Okay, because he, he reproved them and more or less said that, listen, if it's not time to build my house, is it time to build your house then? If mine can't be built, then yours can't be built. It's like, you know, it's like saying, uh, you know, if you're fasting and you tell someone, you know, two people, you make a pact per se and you're fasting. And you say, well, we, we can't eat until two hours uh, from now. And then you come back 30 minutes and you start eating. They're looking at you saying, what's going on? You know, if, 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 if it's two hours left and I have to fast, you got to fast too. OK, uh, so that's that was what was what was taking place. They stopped building God's house. And they began to build their house. And God was not against them building their own homes. You know, he didn't want them to be homeless. He didn't want them to sleep out on the street as such. He was not saying, build me this house and don't have anything for yourself. Or rather, it was how can you build something for you? And I don't have anything. And, and once again, the, uh, the irony of it is that God does not dwell in buildings that are made by bricks as such. So when he's talking about he doesn't have a house, he doesn't have a habitation, Solomon said, look, the heaven of heavens can't contain thee, much less this house that we build. So really, what was he talking about? He was talking about this is a place of worship that I have consecrated. And so, yes, um, it's my house. And when you come to meet there, I am there. You know, I, I am come to visit with my people. I come to fellowship with them. And so I don't want you to not have is just how can you build yours and leave mine in the dust? That was the point that he was making again. And so Haggai and the, uh, the prophet um, Ezra, um, Nehemiah, they do their work, um, Zerubbabel, in trying to instruct and encourage the people to go on. No, we need to build. Uh, we can't sit back. It's time to build. We can't wait down until things open up. And, and again, last week we talked about that, that sometimes a closed door does not mean that that is not the indication of God. So I know you're saying, well, Revelation says, I'll set before you an open door, no man is shut. And so we, we a lot of times look at circumstances and say, well, if the door is open, then that means to go through. And, and it could mean that, okay? Every open door is not a carte blanche invitation to go proceed. Okay? And every closed door is not necessarily an indication not to proceed. And I know that that might sound uh, contrary, but the essence of it, it, it is it is. Okay? Because there, you can look in the scriptures and you'll find different instances in which there was a clear open door to proceed, but it doesn't mean that there were not obstacles. 
You can also find through Scripture, quote, closed doors, but people labored, they prayed, they persevered, and the way was made open. So you can't look at circumstances and say, well, based upon the circumstances, it, there are more aspects uh, to be brought under consideration prayerfully so that the right determination be made, so that circumstances do not necessarily or exclusively dictate to the believer what we should or what we shouldn't do. Nor do resources necessarily dictate. Now, again, that, that's a, a huge part of the formula, all right? But, but then there's also uh, the guidance of God and his instruction. So these variables come to mind, and, and Haggai is, again, sharing. And now we've read in chapter 2 um, last week that God says that he's going to, he spoke to the people. He told them to be strong. He told them to, to work. Well, we saw that in verse 4. Uh, that God was with them, not to be afraid that he was with them, to go forth. And so it was a message of encouraging them. He had reproved them for their wrong, and now he's encouraging them to do that which is right. In addition, he said that this house that you look at and that it's way inferior in all respects to what you've seen, this house is going to be uh, exalted in that the desire of nations is going to come. And we said, who is the desire of all nations? That was Jesus. So Jesus would come here in this uh, inferior building. So on the outside, again, it's smaller in scale. doesn't have the same uh, layout as the Solomon Simple did, but it excelled far surpassed Solomon because Jesus didn't appear in Solomon's Simple, did he? No. Right. God in the flesh came in this temple that is inferior. So this is going to be exalted. So this rebuilt temple, again, um, much smaller than the other one, a, a much, uh, not as nice, not as prestigious, but much more exalted in that the Son of Man actually came there, okay? Now, he taught there, uh, he healed there, he ministered there, and the Bible says that he would bring peace into this place. And that was good news. No, that the God said that his son's going to come into this house and bring peace. And I think that should be one of our objectives whenever we go to worship God is to be transformed, to be enlightened, to be refreshed, but to also receive peace. Because this is his promise. He's, I will be here in this house and I will grant peace. And so he's going to grant peace if we would seek for peace, would ask him for peace. He is the prince of peace, the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 10, the Bible says, think not that I've come to bring peace on, on earth. I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. And that is no contradiction of terms, you see. It is simply saying that the message that I am bringing, that it's going to bring division, it's going to bring separation amongst, amongst you. But if you receive my message and receive my instruction, it will bring peace into your hearts. So he is the prince of peace, offering and bringing peace into this place. Now in verse 10, Haggai chapter 2 and verse 10, we read on the 24th day of the ninth month, and this uh, corresponds to roughly... November or December. And in this historical setting, most scholars, Bible scholars, date it as being December the 18th, 520. So, so it puts us down in the latter portion of the year that this message comes. It says, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, or Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, now ask the priests concerning the law. So he's told to ask the priest regarding the law a question. What is this question? In verse 12, he says, If one were to carry holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the, the edge of it he were to touch bread or pottage, wine or oil, or any food, Will it become what? Holy. holy. Will it become holy? And so it's a, a question that he, that he said in Haggai, ask the, the priest. And so they asked the priest because the priests were responsible for religious instruction. And this is pertaining again regarding the, quote, ceremonial law. If something, if you are carrying a piece of food that was devoted as being holy and it touched the garment, would that garment be made holy? Well, let's go to Levit Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 25. Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 25. Leviticus the 6th chapter in verse 
25. So with carrying this, um, therein make it holy. So in essence, he's saying if you, if you had a, something that was consecrated and you put it inside of a garment, does the food that is consecrated, does it make the garment holy is the question. So in Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 25, here is the, uh, the answer. Verse 25 of Leviticus chapter 6 says, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying that this is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord, for it is most holy. The priest that offereth it for sin, he shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten, in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be what? Shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. So Aaron and, and his sons are instructed that whatever touches the flesh becomes what? Holy. It becomes holy. So if it touches the flesh, it now becomes holy. So whatever touches the flesh is now viewed as being holy. So we can clearly see from the Old Testament that whatever touched the flesh of that which was consecrated, it shall be made holy. Now we'll go back over to Haggai chapter 2. So then if it was a flesh that touched the flesh, then that would become holy. If there were a uh, utensil that touched the flesh, then that would also become holy. So whatever touched it now became holy. So if you picture it then, if you prepared it in a pot, the pot is now holy. If you took out um, tongues to take it out of the pot, the tongues now become holy. If it is set on a plate, the plate now becomes holy. You, got, you have the idea. And so the priest was the one that would eat it because the priest also must be what? Holy. So it's like a holy flesh that's being prepared. And everything that touches it in preparation must be holy or becomes holy by touching it. And the person that consumes it as well, in this case the priest, he also must be holy. So in Haggai chapter 2, in verse uh, 12. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 12. Uh, so we ask again this question. Verse 12, um, it says this. It says, now, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with this skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said what? No. No. No, no, again, there's no contradiction there. Uh, to explain it again, what he is saying is that, that in essence, if there was uh, meat that was carried, that the holy flesh came into, um, if it was carried in a, uh, a person's garment, does that garment now become holy? He said, no. Doesn't become, their garments don't become holy. Okay? In Leviticus chapter 6, the things that were quote, touched in the preparation of it became holy, but you carrying it in your garment didn't make it holy. Verse 13. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be Unclean. So we turn over to Numbers chapter 19. Numbers 19 and verse 11. Numbers chapter 19 and verse 11. Numbers 19 and verse 11. Numbers 19 and verse 11. So he, it's two questions. One was regarding the flesh that was consecrated. And we again saw that if it touched, quote, the uh, garments, the garments don't become holy. However, again, those things that were used in the preparation were holy. So two different things. In Haggai chapter 2, the other question is, well, what about touching the dead? We know in Israel that was a, a, a thing that was not treated lightly. So to come in contact then with the deceased, it would make you ceremonially unclean. Numbers the 19th chapter and the 11th verse. Numbers the 19th chapter. And the 11th verse, it says clearly that he that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean for how long? Seven days. So coming in contact then ceremonially with the deceased or the dead, a person would be unclean for 
seven days. Well, seven days that they were ceremonially unclean. So when we go back over to Haggai, he's asking again in comparison um, this question. He's setting, he's uh, really setting them up. So it says in verse 14, Haggai chapter 2 and verse 14. Okay, Haggai 2 and verse 14. It says, then answered Haggai again and said, so is this people. And so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is what? Is unclean. So, so it's two things that he described first. One was the flesh. He said whatever the flesh, quote unquote, touched, it was looked at as being clean in the preparation. But here he's asking though, but what if you carried the flesh? And clothing, would the clothing become clean? And the answer was what? No. The answer is no. And he says, but now what if a person came in contact with the dead? Would that make them clean or unclean? The answer was it would make them what? Unclean. unclean. And now he's making the comparison then. What is this comparison? Well, he's given us the two things that he's going to bring about or talk about. Number one, what they're offering before God is what? Is it clean or unclean? Uh, let's go back and look at this again. Haggai hey, yeah, chapter 2 and verse 14. Okay? So let, uh, it says, Then answered Haggai hey, yeah, and said, So is this people. So he's making the comparison of the people to what? Two things. The flesh and the deceased. Right? Making a comparison between the flesh and between the deceased. And what did he say about the flesh? We go back into verse uh, 11. Verse 11. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask the, the priest concerning the law, that if one bears holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? So meaning, again, literally, if you carry the, the, the flesh in the, the, this coat now, touch this, does this become holy? said no. So, that be, so it does not transfer and make it holy. And then he said in verse 13, Then said Haggai, one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it become unclean or defiled? And so, but now, if you are, quote unquote, you've touched the deceased, and if I came in and touched this, would that make this unclean? Yes. Okay. So it so one thing is, I just because it was in contact with something holy, the garment doesn't become holy. But now he's saying that what was in contact with that which is dead becomes unclean. Okay. So two different things. You, so he's saying you, you're not transferring holiness from the garment to the thing that is touched. But you are transferring, quote, unquote, uncleanness from the dead to the thing which is touched. Does that make sense? So now he's bringing the, the, the question, or rather not bringing a question, but he's making his point. Here is his point. Verse um, 14. So answered Haggai and said, so is this people. And so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. And that which they offer there is unclean. Okay. Uh, hopefully, you, you're not, hopefully you're not confused. Um, but if you are, I'll try to explain it one more time very quickly. Okay. All right. So he's saying that, look, as a nation, is the nation clean or unclean? Nation is unclean. Why is the nation unclean? Because, again, he said, look, if you're offering something, just because you, quote, touch it, it um, the other parts don't become holy. Doesn't sanctify it. But if you have contact with that which is unclean, you can transfer that over. So he is driving at their actions again, driving at the actions at the root of it. So because you're offering services in the altar, it doesn't make everything holy that you're touching. 
But the unclean actions that you are manifesting and the disregard that you have towards my law, the disregard that you're showing toward my temple, that is bringing uncleanness into every area of your life. That, that's what he is saying here. And, and so we'll explain it. Look in verse 15. Or, I'm sorry, in verse 14 one more time. It says, so then answered Haggai and said, so is this people and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and that which they offer in terms of their offering, their sacrifice. God views it as being unclean. So they have the altar that is there, but again, how have they been living? They've been living contrary to this. And he's brought his displeasure upon them and that which they are now touching is not sanctifying, but it is becoming a disaster. And isn't that really like a, um, a metaphor, analogy of life? That we can offer, quote unquote, to God, spiritual sacrifices. We can offer him praise. We can offer, quote, gifts. We can offer tithe and offering. We can offer those things. But if our hearts are defiled, everything we touch is defiled. That was a lesson he was bringing to them. It, it is not simply, quote unquote, the offering. But it is the, the life that is therein lived. And so all that they are touching is now becoming contaminated. Again, um, not, not literally speaking as such, but symbolically it is becoming contaminated. So they're not going forth spreading life, but they're going forth spreading death. They're not going forth bringing blessings, but they're going forth bringing curses. And so everything they're touching, they have this component there that is built in terms of worship, built in terms of offering, but they are not holy. And they're touching things and defiling it. It is becoming corrupt. And so in verse 15 it says, And now I pray you, consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were, when one came to an heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. And when one came to the press bed to, for to draw fifty vessels out of the press, there were but twenty. And so now he is drawing them back to recall what their experience has been. So he's brought the uh, accusation that they are unclean and they're offering unclean things to God. Why are they unclean? Because they haven't built God's temple. Why are they unclean? Because they have not done what God has bid them to go do. The spiritual house has not been built. They're not laboring to build it. And so he says, look, um, you are now unclean, and what you have done, it is not being blessed. It is not being prospered. How do we see it? Well, in verse 15 again, he says, look, consider from this day forward. From before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. So it's two things he is drawing them to. One, let's look at where we sit right now. And number two, let's look at things from where the the foundation was into where we are now. So it's kind of, you know, drawing it apart in segments of time, like little epochs of time. So let's look from this day forward because I'm going to do something new. But I also want you to look back from when the temple, when you started it, to where we are. So again, they started the temple, but they stopped building, right? This, 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 the foundation um, is just sitting in ruins. In disarray, they have not moved upon it. So what is he saying now? In verse, uh, verse 16, it says, it's since those days, one came to a heap of 20 measures, and there were but 10. In other, in other words, when you came to your grains, and you were expecting to get 20 out of it, you got what? You got 10. And when you went to the, the, the wine vats to get out 50, you got out but 20. So the, the, the grain has not produced as it should have produced. The crops are not bringing forth their yield. The wine vats do not overflow. We're, we're living in uh, tight situations when you should have more. Why is this really what is what he's asking? Because you go expecting this much and you're finding a lot more. And you, and you, you probably had that. I know you, you growing up, you've had to have, have it happen to you. And... You go into the refrigerator, and you go to get the jug, and you're, you know, hot, thirsty, and you're parched, and you just know you're going to have a nice cup of juice, you know. You, or you grow up, and you're going to get uh, some milk, and you go grab it, you have your cereal all prepared, and you go and get the jug, and nothing in there. You know, just a little drop. And you're saying, well, why on earth didn't they just finish this? Why are you going to leave an empty container just sitting up in the refrigerator? 
Doesn't do anybody any good whatsoever to have an empty container. You, I mean, you pour it out and it's just like barely this much. But you went in expecting a whole lot more. And you've been disappointed now. You are, are disheartened because you expected it to be enough to be able to satisfy. And so this is the analogy he's drawing out with them in their, their labor. They've gone in expecting to get this much to reap out, but it is not enough. It's much smaller. And, and they know that the reason why it is smaller is because God had given so many promises that, listen, if you will, will follow me and obey me and keep my covenant in the land that you go in to possess, I'm going to multiply and to bless you. But if you forget about me and worship the other gods of the nations all around, if you turn your back upon me, then I'm going to send blight upon the land. I'm going to send uh, mildew, and it's going to destroy your crops. I'm going to send pestilence and plague so that you will not have. And hopefully in your loss, you might remember me. So, again, he's drawing their attention is what Haggai is seeking to do because of their personal experience. So they don't have. Now, in verse 17 of, uh, of chapter 2, it says, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail. In all the labors of your hands, yet you turn not to me. Again, God is taking the responsibility, saying that I sent this, so you went looking for much, but you didn't find. And why didn't you find it? Because I stopped it. I stopped it from coming. And I didn't do that to harm you. I did that to help you. Again, every difficulty is not, quote, unquote, a means of God seeking to punish us. Yes, yes, he chastises us. But he would seek to use those opportunities as means for us to be able to learn of him, us to be able to be drawn to back to him, us to be able to fellowship in his goodness. And so he says that I struck you, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, saith the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward and from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. So again, um, back to this whole theme. So now, uh, just to, uh, to quickly recap, he has told them that you are defiled, you are corrupt. And look at the land. It's not blessing, it's not, being, it's not prospered as it should. But I'm giving you a promise that I will be able to bring blessing. I have sent a curse, but now I want to send a blessing upon you. And what is the blessing that he says? No, look, he says in verse uh, 18, to consider from this day, the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month, even from that day or this day, that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. In short, what, what God is saying to them is that I want you to go and to change something. Today can be a new beginning. Mark this day down in history. And consider these things and see what I will do from this day forth. So let mark this day as a turning point. You've had adversity, you've had affliction, you've had loss, but mark this day down. And in this day, if you will turn to me, see what I will do. And so now God begins to go through uh, ex exhorting them as to all the things that he is able to do and that he will do if they will turn to him. And he says, mark this day. So this is going to be like a day of destiny. You know, you think of December the 7th, 1941. It was described as being a day of infamy. So it would be a day that you would always remember. And so people remember, now he's saying to them, mark this day. And again, this would be December the 18th and 520, a month of Kislev uh, in the Jewish calendar. That will parallel again to November, late December. And he's saying, listen, this is where you are right now, but mark this date down and let's consider what I will do. What is he saying that he will do? He's considering these things in, in the following verse. Verse 19 says, is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not brought forth. From this day, I will bless you. So let me explain that first part, is the seed yet in the barn? Uh, he is simply saying here uh, that 
Is the seed in the barn like to plant, or have you eaten it? And if you know about the, the planting season, this should have been like two months ago, they should have already planted. They should have already planted, because you talk about the early rain and the latter rain. You know, the early rain fall, fell in the fall, the latter rain would fall into the spring of the year. The early rain was to soften up the soil. Uh, to make it so they could go plant the seed, so that the seed would germinate as it was planted. And then the latter rain would come uh, later on to be able to bring the crop to fruition. And so as Haggai speaks to them regarding the seed, he says, is the seed yet in the barn? And it's twofold again. Uh, the seed, is it in the barn? Is it to plant or have you already eaten it? Meaning the, the resources are there. You remember Jesus talked about um, the, that a grain of corn, that, that if it doesn't fall into the ground, then it abides by itself. But if it falls into the ground, then it brings forth many. And if you plant it, you know that you need seed to plant, seed to be able to produce. So you have to make a decision, essentially, do we eat this or do we plant it, right? That, that's really what it comes down to. I can eat this and have one meal, or I can plant it and hope to have multiple meals. And so he's, Haggai is speaking, he's asking, is the seed yet in the barn? And he says that, that yea, is yet the vine, the fig tree, and the pomegranate, the olive tree, they have not brought forth. So again, all these things have not brought forth their yield. They're seeking for 50, and they're getting 20. They're not getting what they're expecting in return, and they are concerned about it. And God says, I want you to mark this day down, consider this, because from this day on, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to turn this day of mourning into a day of rejoicing. I'm going to turn your sorrow and the heaviness of heart. I'm going to bring peace and gladness. So turn to me and see what I will do in this short time. So he's promising this, that from this day he's going to bless them. We understand, of course, that blessing is contingent upon them obeying, right? It's contingent upon them obeying. In verse 20 now. Uh, of chapter 2. So again, Haggai hey, uh, is bringing this, and, uh, and, and again, he is simply saying, what has been done to pass, mark it from this day forth, I'm going to bring forth a new thing. Consider how this has been blown on, and now contrast it to what I am about to do. So now he's not only blessing them, because he has told them, the temple that looks like it's so small, I'm going to bless the temple. Your life that seems like it's in disarray, I'm going to bless your life. Your, your agriculture, your, your crops that have been lying in ruins in the fields, I'm going to bless your crops. Why is he saying all this? Because God is concerned about every aspect of our lives. He's not saying just build the temple, you know, just take care of me. No, he's concerned about them. But they had forgotten him. And he's turning back to them saying, listen, if you, if you will honor me and put me first, I'm going to bring all these blessings back into your life. But if you keep putting me off and you keep forgetting about me, this is going to be the outcome. It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse and worse. So mark this day down. Let this be a day that you, you, know, you put it down that from this day forth, you're going to look back and see how things were, and you can contrast them to how things are going to become. We, we do that um, as well. We do it, generally speaking, uh, on, the, uh, on New Year's, right? We have our New Year's resolutions and so forth and so on. So, okay, well, uh, last year is gone. This year is going to be totally different. You know, brand new slate. We're going to have a brand new, we're going to, you know, hit the gym, we're going to eat good, we're going to drink our water, we're going to exercise, we're going to walk, we're going to, you know, all these different things we're going to do. This is, you know, New Year. Uh, that's the, the turning part and so forth. When God comes to them, uh, nothing against New Year's resolutions, by the way. But this is not the beginning of their, quote, new civil year. You know, the, the Jewish uh, people, they had two calendars. They had the religious calendar, and they also had the ceremonial cal um, the uh, civil calendar. So they had the religious and also the civil calendar, two calendars that they operated off of. And, and it is interesting that God doesn't stop. And it's also an interesting point to note um, that he doesn't even say, well, on quote, unquote, you have to wait to Sabbath, and this is going to be a new thing. Really, he's saying that, listen, whatever day it is, whatever day of the week it is, whatever time of night it is, whatever time of day it is, it can be a brand new day. 
It could be a brand new beginning. It's not you have to wait until Sabbath to be able to make it right. He said, no, uh-uh. We can do it right now. You don't have to wait until a certain hour to be able to make it right. He says, no, we can do it right now. He's not telling them, well, wait until another week, wait until another month, wait until the beginning of the year when they have the civil calendar change or the religious calendar change. No, from this day forward, if you will take my hand and receive the promise, I'm going to make a distinction, a delineation between what has been and what will become. And so we conclude in verse 20 of uh, Haggai chapter 2. Again, so God has reiterated that I'm going to bless you. I'm going to turn back and restore you. Verse 20, it says, Now again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying that I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. So God will overturn the nations that will array themselves against Israel. I will overturn them. So speak to Zerubbabel again. He was the governor. So it's Haggai the prophet now bringing a word to the governor saying, don't be afraid of the enemies. Because again, greater is he that is with us than he that is with them. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltii, saith the Lord, and I will make thee as a signet. I will make you as a signet. And that word signet means a seal or a seal ring. I want to make you as a signet or as a sealed ring, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, in the Testimonies, volume seven, page, uh, volume 7, page 67, we read that God will not suffer one of his trust-hearted workers to be left alone to struggle against great odds and to be overcome. He preserves as a precious jewel everyone whose life is hid with Christ in God. Of every such one, he says, I will make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee. So Zerubbabel now, he's saying that I'm, I'm choosing you as a signet. I'm choosing you as a sign. That all that I have said, that now I'm going to accomplish, and I'm going to bring it to pass. And so the people heard the words of, of Haggai. And Haggai is one of the very few prophets that when the people listen uh, or the people heard him, they responded. Now they respond. They now determine that they're going to go and to build the, um, the foundation. They're going to go back and they're going to build the temple because they have so many things that are in charge and that are before them. They know that if they go back and to honor God, that God will bless them. God will promote them. God will bring them into obedience and to his divine and perfect favor. Well, again, when we read the book um, that was written um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and there are different uh, lessons certainly that we can draw. Nothing in the context of quote-unquote an application as such. But there are spiritual lessons that we are able to draw from certainly by being able to read. Um, number one, we understand uh, that today we are seeking to build a spiritual house. And that's what we read in the New Testament, that God is building this spiritual house, this spiritual temple. You know, the foundation has been laid of Jesus Christ and the, the, the holy apostles and the prophets have been built upon. And we also know that then there's a part then for us because in one sense, we are as uh, pieces of the temple being fitted and framed to be placed into that building. And we understand that the, the pieces that are brought in, that they are hewed down. And we understand that God's word is that means that hews us down as like the right size block to be placed into this spiritual house that he is building. We also recognize and understand that it also uh, is also symbolic of the Gentiles that must also be gathered in. And by the same process, they must be hewed down. Uh, they must be brought into place to be as pieces put into the house of God. But again, when we look at the marble and the structure that is there, it talks about being polished. And when you polish something, you, you make it shine. It's like you, you, you buff it. You know, you polish your shoes up. You polish your car up. You make it shine. You, know, you can be washed, but when you polish it, it just brings it up. You know, what are you doing? You're causing the, um, the, the uh, reaction there. Any luster that was lost is now being taken away. 
And so we're as fit vessels polished after the divine similitude so that, that in effect God is saying, I will put you into this spiritual house. Not dull though, but lively. Not as unpolished, but as polished. So that when you polish a stone, then you're able to be able to see it glimmer, to be able to see it shine and to glisten. And so we are not are quote unquote dead stones, but the Bible says you are living stones brought into this living temple, which is the body of Christ. And so this church then is to be built in the same fashion. And yet there's so many things that will detract us from the work that we should do. And yet the same message then would then be applicable to us uh, because we can become so consumed uh, with the things that we must do. You know, there's some people who say, well, I need to wait until, quote, unquote, the Sunday law. Then I'll start doing something to be able to share. Well, that's not, that's not what the Sunday law is about. It's not to wait until that to do something. But that's the same concept. I'm going to wait until the time. And others that look and see, well, circumstances that are forbidding, that will not open the door. And yet again, we may go on with our lives, but the same thing is true when God is saying that, listen, from this day forth, mark it down. If you will make a covenant and a commitment with me, you can see what has been. And so they can look back at that day on December the 18th, 520. They can look back and see that, okay, we started the temple back some years. And it is nothing has come to pass, but all of our crops have been blighted. We have not enjoyed the blessing of God. But from this day forth, we're going to put God first and we're going to see that from this day going forward, that now the temple is built. Now the foundation is laid. Now the crops have been planted. Now the blessing of God is there. And we may but ask ourselves, if we knew that God was going to do so much, then why do we wait so long to ask of him? And so we uh, ask of us the same question because the same promises are for us as well today. If we know that God is willing to do so much, then why? Uh, why do we wait so long to ask of him? Let us then therefore ask in faith and then mark this day down as a day of new beginnings, a day of enjoying the blessing that God so richly wants to bestow upon each and every one of us. Father, uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for, uh, for being with us. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be able to read in uh, Haggai. And we know that the challenges there are the challenges still that we face today. We get it that not coming to church makes us holy. Uh, not carrying Bibles in our hands makes us holy. Not even reciting the Bible text makes us holy. Because we have been in contact with those who are, are spiritually dead. And the spiritually dead amongst the spiritually dead, we can't bring life. We can't bring blessing. We can only bring contamination. But there is one who is holy. There's one that is, who is pure. And into your presence, we come. Into his presence, we come and we ask and pray in faith that you would please forgive us of all of our sins. We pray in faith that you would take our filthy and polluted hearts and give us a heart of flesh that has been born again by the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would please help us to labor to build this spiritual temple, to not look at the uh, patterns that may be around us, uh, forebodings that may tell us not to labor, um, but we look to the instruction that you've given and we go forth doing the work that you've called us to do leaving the results in your hands. So we again pray that you would bless us and keep us. And please uh, mark this day down and have, help us to mark it as a day from henceforth that you will bless us because we have sought uh, to bring our lives into full harmony with your divine will. So I pray that you would give us the strength and the grace to be able to carry on. In Jesus' name we humbly ask and pray.